than regulated out of existence. Turning to the um, the mandate of the for the regime, um, which which you have here, um, I talked a little bit about eight J, so I'll focus on uh, the other two elements. Um, Suffice to say, and this is the thing you see over and over again with the international regime, we, have, we don't have absolute clarity on the definition of a genetic resource and at this stage we have no consensus in the negotiations or the sc- on the scope, nature or objectives of the regime. So the fundamentals are not in place with 11 months to go until Nagoya. There is a negotiating text it's heavily bracketed, but I think it's fair to say that the, sort of the chapter headings are more or less agreed, but the text isn't. The first element of the mandate is the objectives of the CBD, conservation of biological diversity, sustainable use of its components, and the fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising from the utilisation of genetic resources. The second element... Um, is Article 15 and Article 15 confirms national sovereignty over genetic resources also contains some obligations on parties and clarification regarding the terms under which access should take place um, particularly prior informed consent and mutually agreed terms Article 15 also confirms that the objective of the international regime is to encourage sustainable uses, which we interpret to mean to promote appropriate economic activity. We view that as an important guide to what the underlying ethos of the international regime should be, um, and also as a signal that the IR needs to respect some of the basic principles of other agreements, such as non-discrimination. If we look at who who will be affected by this international regime, I think private and public uses of genetic resources will certainly be covered. Um, There's been a lot of debate about whether you can differentiate private sector use and public sector use, um, but clearly both are covered. Um, Within the private sector, a wide range of industries will be affected, and this is probably not the complete list. As far as we know, the IR will apply to established and emerging industries, both large companies and small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, It's worth bearing in mind in this that quite often when you talk about the international regime, you have to apply like a common sense test to what it's about. So I'll give you an example. As I noted earlier, there's no agreed definition of genetic resources. in principle, the definition we have suggests that trade in bread should be covered by the international regime. Bread is the subject of a biological process and it contains genetic material. The common sense test says, no, that's not what we were trying to achieve. I think I've never heard anyone propose that bread should be covered. Point being that we have a certain lack of clarity there that at some point we have to address. Within our own industry, um, I think probably my colleagues could probably add to this list, but we, you can envisage that genetic resources or materials from them could be used in a number of ways. They could be used as a starting point in developing an active compound, the idea you get something from nature. You then probably substantially modify it. You have to take it through the R&D process, and at the end you have a medicine on the market. There can be elements of vaccines. Um, There can be inactive parts of the final product and they may be used as tools in the research process or as a tool in the production process, for example, in fermentation, perhaps. Um, So you have have, um, a wide range of sectors covered by the international regime, even if I exclude the common sense ones, there is still a wide range that are covered. Um, 
and within each of those sectors I suspect you have a wide range of uses, certainly in ours. Um, this draw takes us to a sort of certain prelim preliminary observations which are that unless you can encourage economic activity through the regime there are going to be no benefits to share and this point was made earlier with reference to one particular case study. Now at the moment what's happening is that more often than not the problem we have is that the agreements that are not being struck because people can't get legal certainty over who they should deal with and this is something the regime has to address, it has to facilitate those contacts. Um, the diversity of uses between and within sectors to us suggests the regime has to be highly flexible. Not only are there a wide range of sectors that um, will be covered by the regime, but we should also anticipate there may be business activities out there which don't yet exist, which could be covered. So the regime should not be too prescriptive and should be open to a range of business models. Um, with that in mind, I wanted to talk a bit about what what we think we contribute, what we can contribute to the regime and what we would like to see from it. Um, the first contribution that I think we can make from the private sector is to provide what I've called support tools. Uh, there are a number of these, but one of the most obvious would be a code of conduct developed at an industry level and potentially these can provide countries and negotiating parties with some confidence regarding the principles that potential business partners will apply and their commitment to the goals of the international regime. One of the trickiest issues in the, um, the discussions around the international regime of what do you do when you have dispute settlement? Or what do you do when you have disputes? Um, and particularly when those disputes have some tra transport boundary aspect um, and here in many cases the, you know, we have existing arbitration dispute settlement procedures which already work they work both between private sector entities and in part between government and private sector entities and through organisations like the International Chamber of Commerce we have some capacity for training people in how those things work. Uh, for some sectors, it may be that an approach they can use is to contribute model clauses to give some sort of framework for, um, for potential partners to start their contractual negotiations. What we need from the regime is that these tools are recognised as having a contribution to make um, and that the, the parties in what they eventually negotiate provide the space for these tools to be used. Um, if the regulatory regime established under the international regime is too rigid, then simply these sorts of things have no place. Um, we also, we need legal certainty. Whenever I ask my colleagues, you know, what's the most important thing, I think this is the thing that they say we need legal certainty that who is the focal point, is the, what decisions is the focal point empowered to make, those sorts of things. Um, and as I say, we need an appropriate level of regulation. Um, second, the most obvious way in which we contribute is by actually doing business in a sustainable and responsible way. The when, when people are, uh, are negotiating in this area, typically there will be a range of monetary and non 